Unlimited Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, today we've got a very special guest. His name is Ash Dykes. This guy is a Welsh explorer, adventurer, and extreme athlete, and I've got to put a lot of emphasis on the word extreme. This dude has done a lot of different things. You may recognize that name because just earlier this year, I think it was in January, he appeared on the Joe Rogan Experience, and so let me give you a rundown because this might jog your memory on who exactly this guy is. I'm just going to read this stuff from his website to give you an idea of what he's been doing over the last several years. He walked solo and unsupported across Mongolia in 2013. In 2014, age 23. The 1500 mile journey over the Altai Mountains and across the Gobi Desert took 78 days. He became known to locals as the Lonely Snow Leopard. In 2015, he completed the 1600 mile trek across Madagascar via its eighth highest peaks and which was another world first. Along the way, he contracted the deadliest strain of malaria possible and was close to death. As a result of the experience, he is now a special ambassador for the charity Malaria No More UK. In August of 2018, he embarked on another world first record attempt to walk the 4,000 mile course of the Yangtze River. The successful completion of his year long mission earned him celebrity status in China. So guys, all three of those things that I just mentioned, Mongolia, Madagascar, and the Yangtze River in China, those were all world first. No one had ever pulled off those things ever before. And this was all before the age of 30. When, when we recorded this podcast, the guy's 29 years old, an incredibly interesting guy. We talk about a lot of things. We talk about all the things that we just talked about here, all these different missions, how he trained and prepared for these missions, what gear he used, what gear is useless, the times when he almost died. I mean, guys, we go deep on all of these. So without further ado, let's get into it. Ash Dykes, welcome to Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. Hey, man. Good to be on here. Hey, man, I, I think you're the first adventurer, explorer that we've ever had on this podcast. So that's kind of a, a unique thing. I mean, do you have that Boom, on a business card go. or something? You should have that on a business card if you don't. Yeah, I used to, you know, I used to. But now everything is just online. You know what I, I mean? It's like yeah. a business card. I never had it. But when I did have a business card, yeah, it was adventurous slash extreme athlete. And I'd always have the person look at that and say, what does this mean? <laughs> and then it gets tricky for me because I don't know how to really explain that without taking five <laughs> minutes of their time. <laughs> right. Well, I was joking uh, because your Instagram is pretty much your business card at this point. So people don't know that yeah. right now. They should. But I want to just kick things off today with, you know, kind of the thing that sparked you being this household name. And that's because you appeared on the Joe Rogan experience. And so obviously that is the most, probably the most popular podcast on planet earth. It's certainly one that's on the tip of everybody's tongue. So if you could just to start out, Take our audience through what it was like being on that show. I mean, how did they get in touch with you? How long were you there in studio? Is Joe secretly a horrible person? You know, just just give us the rundown <laughs> on, on your experience. Yeah, so it all happened via email. So it was by email. Uh, it was a fairly fast turnaround. So it was, just, when was that? It was the end of December to come out in, to fly out to Los Angeles in January. Um, so I, did, I didn't mess about. I was, I was straight out there. Uh, I had a, a friend uh, of mine here in Wales who flew out with me and it was just a great time. You know, we rocked up in his sort of man cave, which is massive. It's, it's, it's just awesome. He's got a bit of everything inside. Um, and I was greeted by his, by his security guards who were amazingly welcoming. You know, they showed me around, they invited me inside. Uh, and at that time, Joe was live uh, or on air with uh, Joey Diaz. And so about an hour later, Joey Diaz um, wrapped up. And so I met Joey. I met Joe. Uh, we hung out for a bit, said bye to Joey. Uh, Rogan gave me some of this coffee, which has turmeric inside. It's really healthy stuff. It's, it's tasty. And then that's it. We went inside and we cracked on with the podcast. And to be honest, it was just such an amazing time. I think the podcast lasted about two and a half hours. But even afterwards, we were still talking for another hour. Um, we had so much to talk about. But he is just as cool off podcast as he is, uh, as you see him on YouTube. There's no, there's no change, uh, which is great. So, it, yeah, you know, very hospitable, very welcoming. He made me feel at home. It was uh, an awesome experience for sure. Well, the thing that's interesting whenever you listen to his podcasts and whenever you actually watch, you can see that his guests are very comfortable. You can see some of them are, are tentative um, there at the very beginning, but then they do kind of settle in. I've, I've had a few people on this show before. I've had Zuby, Pat McNamara. They, they've been on the Joe Rogan experience. Was there yeah. anything that you 
maybe wanted to communicate that you didn't feel like you had the opportunity to? Was there anything that came up like that? Um, I don't think there was, you know. I don't think there was. There were, of course, there were so many more stories that I could have, I could have said, uh, but two and a half hours is a long time uh, to get a decade worth of adventures and exploits in. So, of course, it's, it's like that with every podcast. I like to think that every podcast I go on, hopefully with, your, uh, with yours as well, I'll bring something new to the table that I haven't discussed on any of the previous podcasts just because there is so much to discuss. It's been 10 years of um, living this uh, adventurous life, but then another five years of building up to it and breaking my goals down, planning the logistics and whatnot. And so, so yeah, there's, again, a lot to discuss, but I finished and I was, I was happy. That was my first, that was my first in-person podcast, actually. Yeah. The Joe Very Rogan. Cool. And I told Joe that and he was, I know, I felt like I cheated the system and slipped right in there to the top, you know? <laughs> Right. Yeah, you, you kind of did. You cut the line in front of everybody. But I will tell you, even if you're even if your answers are boring today, you're the first guy to talk with a Welsh accent on this uh, podcast. So we're going to be we're going to be just <laughs> fine, I would say, because you're at least going to sound cool. So uh, just to kind of go go back to before uh, you were this uh, world renowned adventurer explorer. I remember you talking about on the Joe Rogan experience that you were on your way to being a corporate guy, to literally carrying around a business card with no irony whatsoever, but living kind of the lifestyle of a corporate business person. But actually you mentioned that you had one comment. This, this really stuck out for me from your, your interview with Joe. You, had, yeah. you heard a comment from your boss and it kind of pushed you towards the life that you're leading now. Can you kind of take us through what the comment was? Yeah, well, that was actually a reminder um, so I was living the travel life, but I then slipped into working in Australia, uh, selling Australia power and gas. And this only lasted for probably about one, one and a half months, this job. Um, and yeah, it was sort of, I was, you know, had this suit on. We were sort of walking around streets, knocking on people's doors, trying to sell this Australian power and gas. And I was new to it. Um, so I was shadowing my, my boss um, on the fifth or sixth day. And yeah, he sort of walked up to this driveway. Uh, I already had a feeling that, you know, I don't know about this job. It's been a, it's been a few weeks now. I'm really not enjoying it. Uh, it's not why I set off for traveling. But of course, I needed this job to help top up the funds so that I could continue traveling. So it was almost like a checkpoint. Uh, and so whilst I'm here on this checkpoint selling this power and gas, we approach this guy who's doing all sorts of, like you mentioned earlier on in, in this podcast about the break dancing uh, whilst you're doing pull-ups type of thing, you know, he was right. doing all of these swaying motions as he was doing these pull-ups and he jumped down anyway. Um, and my boss, you know, tried to sell the Australian power and gas. The guy declined politely saying, but I appreciate what you guys are doing, you know, walking around wearing suits in, in 40 degrees Celsius, uh, which is hundred degrees Fahrenheit, trying to sell Australia power and gas to make a living. And then, my my boss just turned around, you know, it's so cringeworthy, rubbed his fingers as in the, doing the money sign and said, yeah, but we get paid a lot of this though. And I drive a skyline. And instantly it was just a slap in the face. And the guy replied straight away, well, it's not all about the money, is it? It's about the lifestyle too. And that was kind of like an awakening, uh, a, a reawakening, should I say, you know, because I didn't come all the way to Australia and plan to travel this far to then do something that I could do back here in Wales. Uh, I did know that I was only topping up the funds and I wouldn't be in this job for a long time anyway, but it was just a slap in the face. I was getting a little bit un unhealthy because my boss uh, liked to eat KFC every morning. I obviously <laughs> wouldn't do that, but he was a whole different lifestyle. I was always into my fitness, into my uh, nutrition. Uh, and I was putting on a bit more weight. I was walking around in a suit and I, it just wasn't me. It just wasn't, wasn't me. I'm not saying it's the wrong thing to do. I'm just saying it wasn't me. And that guy just, you know, I think in, in life we always have these little nudges and I've had it for the past 10 to 15 years, little things that send me in a different direction. And that is an example of, you know, a little thing that, that spurred me on. The next day I quit my job. I purchased myself a $50 woman's mountain bike because that's all I could afford. And me and my friend, we cycled across southern part of Australia from Melbourne to Adelaide along the Great Ocean Road. Uh, and that, re you know, that ignited this spirit of adventure again. I was like, yes, you know, I'm back at it doing what I have been doing for the past few years and doing what I love. <laughs> 
Well, and I think the the word I really liked that you used was nudges, because I think a lot of guys uh, that are maybe living kind of the cubicle corporate life or, you know, doing something that they don't really feel any desire or fire or passion about, uh, they get those nudges and a lot of guys just ignore them. And that's one thing I've, I've talked about on this podcast before is I feel like sometimes God whispers to us. And mm. you kind of you kind of filter it through your brain, like, okay, where is this whisper coming from? Is this God? Is this Satan? Did, did I eat KFC this morning so I have gas? You know, it's like, what? Where yeah, is this yeah. thought coming from? But for a lot of guys, at the very very least, and I'm sure you would agree with this, Ash, they just need to explore that nudge or explore that whisper a little bit because yeah. there's going to be some level of confirmation along the way, wouldn't you think? If that was a real nudge? Yeah, no, definitely, I do agree. I think. Don't dismiss it so early, you know, if you're, if, if you're happy and these nudges happen, um, then great, it doesn't, doesn't matter as much. But if there's, you know, if you feel like you need a change and there's lots of little things that are nudging you, are putting you into a different direction and that's what you're, you're wanting, then, then go for it. Because, you know, I do believe we, we must pursue and follow our heart, our passion, uh, and we mustn't ignore it. I absolutely agree. And so let's go ahead and get into what the majority of guys know you for now outside of the Joe Rogan experience. And, and that is the missions that you've been on. So I definitely want to kind of cover what you did with Mongolia, Madagascar, and the Yangtze River. But let's just start with Mongolia. So for the, the listeners that don't know, on the 5th of August of 2014, you actually became the first person in recorded history to complete a solo and unsupported walk across Mongolia. And so I think the, the first place to start is what does – unsupported mean? I guess, what are the uh, parameters around what makes a walk solo and unsupported and, and why did you choose to do it in that way? Yeah, it's interesting because with the whole Mongolia trip, uh, I was planning that originally uh, unintended like, without realizing that it was a record. Um, so I had done lots of previous adventures before Mongolia yeah, and a lot of reckless, dangerous adventures, um, not for social media, just for the passion. You know, I wasn't sharing right. anything on, on social media for the first, probably for the first four or five years. I was purchasing $10 bikes. I was cycling across Cambodia and Vietnam with not even a pump or puncture repair kit. Um, you know, I was trekking into jungles, sort of crossing from Thailand into Myanmar, uh, learning how to survive in the jungle with Burmese hill tribes. All of this was on a, a low budget. I think most days I was spending a couple of dollars per day especially on that Vietnam cycle, we'd spend 20 cents and we'd be sleeping in a hammock shop uh, overnight. You know, we were trekking the Himalayas and India. And so all of these sort of reckless adventures, I was 19 uh, at the time, these reckless adventures in Southeast Asia really, really um, embedded into me, you know, even to the point of going to Australia and taking on journeys, whether it's hitchhiking across the north because our car broke down in the outbacks, or cycling down the south because we got sick of our work as the Australia power and gas salesman. Um, all of these adventures played a key part when I did finally settle in Thailand for two years as a master scuba diving instructor and Muay Thai fighter. You know, talk about what we were mentioning uh, earlier about following your passion. My big nudge then was, or not a nudge, but something that played on my mind constantly every day was adventure. I loved the lifestyle I was living in Thailand. There were, you know, beaches, scuba diving. So it was extreme sports. It was martial arts. It was fitness, nutrition. I should have been happy, but I was 21 and I just had this itch. I knew that I was, there was more stuff out there for me to do. I hadn't seen what I was truly capable of. Um, and I just, I was, I had this taste for adventure and I didn't want to ignore it. I wanted to pursue this adventurous life. So I was thinking, where can I go that is extreme? What country am I unfamiliar with? And Mongolia just instantly stood out. I was a scuba diver meeting travelers every day. Uh, and not, I didn't come across any main topic of conversation is, is to talk about traveling, of course, because they're all sort of scuba diving to ticket off their bucket list. And you ask them where they've been and when they plan, uh, where they plan on going. And I didn't come across one traveler who said they've come from Mongolia or they plan on going to Mongolia. Mongolia was just that big question mark. Didn't know much about the place. I was curious. So my initial idea was, right, I need to pack in this scuba diving job and I need to do something in Mongolia. I like the idea of walking because I had done plenty of cycles before. And for me, cycling is awesome, but you're on a road and where there's road, there's people, where there's people, there's food, there's water, you're relatively safe. Uh, but the idea of walking 
you know, you could go places where cars, vehicles, uh, bikes can't get to. And I liked the idea of relying on myself to survive the journey. And I knew that Mongolia was home to the Gobi Desert, to the Altai Mountains, the Mongolian steppe. You know, you've got the reindeer herders up north, the camels down south, the eagle hunters in the far west, originally introduced from Kazakhstan, which borders Mongolia. And I was just fascinated. So I thought maybe do a 100-mile walk or maybe do a 200-mile walk. <laughs> right. Um, maybe go in a group or maybe go with my friend Matt, who uh, Matt was always traveling uh, with me for the first few years. We left North Wales. We were both saving up lifeguarding. Um, and boom, off we went. But he didn't really like the idea of Mongolia. I think um, the dangers scared him. The dangers sort of put him off and was like, yeah, maybe you're on your own on this one. Uh, and yeah, I then decided why not attempt to walk its entire length. So when I decided that, I started to realize that, okay, this is going to be, I'm going to have to do it alone. So I started to look for those people who had done it before. And I did extensive research. I even started contacting logistics uh, companies and fixers on the ground in Mongolia, the Real Geographic Society in the UK. And we couldn't find any evidence to suggest that anyone had completed a solo and unsupported walk across Mongolia. But we did find someone who had attempted, uh, and he had attempted three times, but was unfortunately evacuated. I think it was just before or just after the halfway point. Um, but I reached out to this guy, and he claims to be the first to the first recorded to actually attempt the solo on a support walk. And when I contacted him, he was a decent guy, you know, nice fella. He he reached back out to me, and my biggest question was sort of what are the dangers? And he got back with this big list, you know, the dangers <laughs> wow. are the grey wolves, the drunken nomadic drifters, the sandstorms, the snow blizzards, the steep ravines, the dry wells, and the list went on and on. And then I started to research who this guy is, and I realised he was a navy soldier, he was a desert explorer, he's crossed the Sahara Desert, and I'm just instantly i just shrivel up feel so insignificant and i'm right, like right and i've cycled vietnam <laughs> you know uh and i'm a scuba diver here on an island and i'm about to go to the desert for the first time and try to cross it so you know i had a, i had a lot of fear and i had a lot of doubt so i dismissed mongolia and ignored it uh start to focus on more populated and more safer countries to walk but that's when i realized you know just because no one's found a way to do something it doesn't mean it can't be done. Um, and that's when I realized if I can do the right training, the right preparation, have the right logistics team, uh, study all of the things that could go wrong and learn how to overcome them, then maybe this expedition can be achieved. Um, and so solo and unsupported. So solo meaning I would be on my own. There'd be no one walking with me. Um, and unsupported meaning I wouldn't have a van nearby. You know, if... If I need to be picked up, I can't just sort of whistle the van, which is trailing behind me a couple of miles or in front of me. I would be out on my own. And that also meant that I would need to carry all of my provisions in order to survive, which I pulled um, for the 78 days for the 1,500 miles. I pulled a trailer behind me, sort of had this three-point harness. Um, and that that came to a weight at its max load that was 18 stone, so 120 kilograms, which is about 260 pounds, I believe. Uh, and that's three weeks over the Altai Mountains, five weeks through the Gobi Desert, and three weeks across the Mongolian steppe. Well, uh, Nash, so I, have... I, I did want to ask you about, about your trailer because sure. you had a lot of problems with it. And like I, I sitting here having not ever done something like this, is there another way that it could have been done? Cause obviously you, you made it, but you did have a lot of problems with the trailer, you know, obviously having to traverse mountains and you had to go through sandy areas and all that. And, and for any of you guys that think that's not a big deal, go pull something through sand and see how easy it is. But you know, what, what were your thought? What was the thought process around doing a trailer the way that you did it? Yeah. So we found many people who would trek different parts of Mongolia um, thanks to my logistics manager, Rob Mills, out in Mongolia. And we contacted these guys. They are sort of the most experienced trekkers within Mongolia. And they pretty much said it, it, it's just not possible to cross the route that I was taking. Um, it's not possible to cross uh, the land with a rucksack. You would need a trailer. And even then, they, they didn't believe it was possible. So I had a, this is why I had a lot of the doubts and a lot of fears um, 
And the main reason is, is because some of the water wells are spaced so far apart from one another. So you'd need to be carrying, you know, I had a container which was, which would hold 20 liters. That's 20 kilograms of just water right? Um, on its own. And my trailer, I didn't have no funds. I, I've always, it's all, always been sort of low budget adventures. And so my trailer wasn't this nice carbon fiber built in a factory. It was just built in my uh, a family friend's backyard. <laughs> and it was mild steel because that's all we could afford. And so on an empty load, that is already 40 kilograms. I don't know what that is in pounds, but that's 40 kilograms with nothing in it. Um, you know, 60 with just the trailer, just the water. But of course, we were carrying like five weeks worth of ration packs, clothing, camping equipment, electronics, the whole shebang. Um, and so, yeah, we realized that, okay, if I'm going to do this, I've got to listen to these experienced hikers who say it's not possible. You know, that's why they say the nomads, when they travel, because the nomads cross the country all the time, they're all over the place. But that's why they travel as a, as a community with each other or with the camels, always actually with the camels or with the yaks that carry the supplies uh, because they, you know, they are going uh, far distances. And so, yeah, we realized that the only way to do this was with a trailer. And as you know, a lot of man, uh, a lot of hauling expeditions do fail because of the trailer. But luckily mine was, was robust. I had no problems. My only issue with the trailer was that it was heavy. And whilst in the Gobi Desert, it was a lot of gravel mixed with soft sand. When right. you're in that soft sand, it's like pulling a concrete block through hell. And I mean, that's one of the things that people don't understand is I think most people think when you say something along the lines of, hey, I walked this many miles, they're thinking as the crow flies, they're not thinking about anything in between. So you weren't just mm. walking on a private trail road all these miles, which would have been hard enough in the time that it took you to do it. Mm. But one of the things that you did, you've talked about before, I've heard you say, is that Mongolia, of all the places you've been and all the things that you've done, that it was the wildest place that you've been to. And you mentioned a little bit earlier with, with the, the animals and, and all the different things, but why, why is Mongolia the single wildest place that you've been? Having, you know, obviously lived in Australia, you, you said you walked through the outback, which is a place that you don't want to find yourself because everything out there wants to kill you. Why is Mongolia <laughs> even, even worse than that? Yeah, there was something about Mongolia that just made me feel so far, so far from home. I mean, I was, but I went over, I think I went eight days without seeing a single person at one point, you know, and you're, and in the Altai Mountains, you're high, you're over 3,000 meters altitude, you're, you're vulnerable, you're being hit by the elements, there's wolves, um, there's strong winds, it can drop to minus 50, minus 20 degrees Celsius. Yeah, sometimes it's it's just um, a place that makes you feel so vulnerable. And I did experience that a lot. So I would say Mongolia and Qinghai province, which is in the west of China, where I started Mission Yangtze, are two of the wildest places I've been because you just feel so alone. And it's difficult, isn't it? Because it's easy. I'm, I'm a fool for doing it too, but it's easy for me to look at a challenge or an adventure on TV and be like, yeah, I could do that. I'd love to do that. But I'm saying, I'm saying that when I'm in shelter, when I've got a, a, a belly full of food and I've got a warm cup of tea in my hand, when I'm in high spirits, when I'm feeling positive and I'm in full fitness mentally and physically. But when you're out there and you are hungry, you're thirsty, you're beating, you're in pain, and you don't have shelter, you've not eaten for, how, for however long, you know, and you realize that, backup isn't so with, with my backup especially the previous guy i think he was evacuated by helicopter because his wife was russian and he had had, uh, had, uh, whoa, had access to the russian military couldn't get my right. words out um but with myself with it being so low budget my only means of escape was uh <laughs> was a text only satellite phone to my <laughs> agent based in the capital and i would need to rely at least three to four days for him to get to me and then another day or two for him to get me to safety you know, if I Ash, stood that's on not the a great plan. Of, that's really yeah, not a great plan. <laughs> that's it. You know, if I stood on the back end of a snake, four days is just too, <laughs> too long, isn't it? Um, and I did almost lose my life because of that whole reason. You know, I faced a scenario where I was past the point of backup and my only option was to, to walk myself to safety, which was very scary. Um, so, yeah, there's that vulnerability as well of, of knowing, well, look, this isn't, fil this isn't being filmed by Nat Geo. You know, I've not got a helicopter that's going to whip me out. I am on my own and I'm walking past these camel carcasses 
thinking, yeah, I could just end up being a carcass, you know. It's, ugh, it plays with your mind. It is uh, tough, tough mentally, well, for sure. Well, one last thing on Mongolia before we move on to Madagascar is you mentioned having to deal with the sandstorms. And to me, uh, of all the things that, that you mentioned on that laundry list of dangerous things that could happen, especially the list that you got from that guy, the sandstorms yeah. seem to be the one that would freak me out the most just because it's anyone that's not experienced a sandstorm before. Like, just go go Google it. It's like this, it's like biblical almost. It's like this wall <laughs> yeah. of nonsense heading your direction and it doesn't just pass you by in 30 seconds. It lingers and it disorientates you and all these different things. So how hard was it dealing with sandstorms? Was this like a daily occurrence? Like how, how often did this come up? No, there were always sort of little dust storms uh, in the Gobi every now and then, but I would say I faced three uh, relatively big sandstorms during my time. Um, and yeah, you're right. They don't just pass by so fast. You're in them for, I think the longest I was in the sandstorm was about 20 minutes, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe 30 minutes if you include the after effect of it, you know, where it's not so strong. Um, but that's painful because it's not just sand. It's, it's whipping up. It's also some stones and small pebbles as well. Uh, and it causes like a sandpaper or like a whipping effect on your skin. So you do have to cover up. I've got my gloves on. I put my, I had um, like ski goggles, you know, the mask that you can put on. I had right. a buff to cover myself, a hat, gloves, a fleece to cover my arms. Uh, and you've just got a brace, but I didn't stop walking. You know, I was always keen to cover distance. So once I felt protected, I did try to plow on. I would find like a little track, maybe a goat track, camel's track or motorbike track and just try to, to follow that because you're right, it's dark, it's noisy and it's easy to get disorientated for sure. Well, that sounds uh, pretty terrible. I don't know why you do that to yourself, but we'll just keep this going because you keep torturing yourself, but that's why you're on this podcast. So uh, the next big mission was Madagascar. So you actually became the first person in recorded history to ever traverse Madagascar's length. Um, and you went through the interior. And so you had to deal with uh, eight of the highest mountains. And that is the fourth largest island in the world. You ended up trekking about 1600 miles in about 155 days. So the thing that you mentioned and that I thought was funny whenever you described this particular mission is that it was really sketchy. That was the word you used that this entire trip <laughs> was just sketchy. So, so what was so sketchy about Madagascar? Oh man, you know, when you think of Madagascar compared to Mongolia, I had a lot of people, especially when I announced it uh, in the press, I had a lot of people debating, you know, like, oh, he's gone from the big, mighty Mongolia to to the little island where the lemurs are in Madagascar. Right. <laughs> they, they, they were massively mistaken. Madagascar was, it was intense. It was, well, you, you said it yourself, that was only 100 miles longer than Mongolia, yet it took almost double the duration. It took 155 days compared to 78 days that it took to cross Mongolia. It just seemed that every day, there was, with Madagascar, there wasn't one just, pleasant day's trek it was never well that was a nice day's walk it was never that it was just challenge after challenge and let me break some of these challenges down i had to avoid the bandits down south that were causing all sorts of havoc i was held up at gunpoint by the military a drunken officer in fact uh, i caught the, the deadliest strain of malaria i almost lost my life um luckily it's been eradicated fully out of my system because it was the You've got the deadliest strain, but you've got three other strains. And the three lower strains, the malaria can remain dormant. But the deadliest, which is called falciparum, can kill you within 24 hours. But if you catch it within that time, it's the only strain that can be eradicated. And so I had that eradicated. That was only one month into a five-month expedition. Um, and I had now lost 13 kilograms because of it and had a, another four months left of the highest mountains and the densest jungles. But I cracked on after eight days. Um, the leeches. So we had the leeches dropping from the jungle canopy uh, as we're sort of hacking through the bush, machete in hand. Uh, no one really goes through the interior. It's, it's very wild. It's dense jungle. Um, not much of a population up there. Difficult to find more food, more water. Uh, but that's, you know, that was part of the challenge. And then I just added the fact that that's some of the eight highest mountains whilst I'm doing it. Um, big mistake, but I, I had set out, <laughs> I had said I was going to do it. So now I had to do it. So a lot of the time hacking through the jungle, sometimes covering only a couple of miles and a whole 12 to 14 hours of walking. 
Wow. Hunting and gathering um, from the jungle, we'd come across coconut or mango or sugar cane, sometimes little tenrecks, uh, which are like rodents that burrow underneath the trees. Um, we got lost in the jungle. We faced cyclone season. Um, the rivers, a lot of the rivers in Madagascar uh, are occupied by crocodiles, and we had a lot of river cross crossings, often having to build rafts using natural resources. Um, and of course, Gertrude, which I'm sure you're familiar about the Gertrude story, maybe. Uh, well, I am, but let's go ahead and fill the rest of our listeners in as well. Yeah. So in order to summit the highest mountain uh, in Madagascar called Marimacocho, it's tradition that you must carry yourself a white living cockerel in order to protect yourself from the bad spirits and witches of the rainforest. Right. Malagasy <laughs> locals say. Yeah. Bonkers, super logical. But, super logical, right? <laughs> yeah. But I'm all about respect. You know, this is why I travel. I love meeting, meeting people. I love different cultures, traditions. So I'm all about respecting their culture. So I did. I carried myself a, a white chicken called Gertrude. I do realize he was male and I gave him a female, female name. Um, and Gertrude was with me for two and a half weeks, I think. Two and a half weeks. I had to feed him. I had to give him water. He became fully domesticated, didn't really need to, to tie him up. Sometimes he got lazy and he got tired, so I'd put him in the top of the rucksack and his little head would poke out and he'd be making all sorts of chirping <laughs> noises, which really irritated me most times when I was hungry. <laughs> right, right. Uh, he, he would sleep on top of my tent at night, which sounds nice, but there's loads of chicken droppings the next morning, so you've got to clean your tent down. Um and yeah, we, we set him free. We, we, we couldn't bring him back down off the mountains. I was hoping he would follow me. You know, he became a bit like a pet. He was like a little pet dog. But um, yeah, we left him on the peak of Marimacocho during the cyclone season. But hey, who knows? Maybe he survived. Maybe he's king of the mountain right now. <laughs> it's certainly possible. So Gertrude, if you're out there, man, we're, we're here for you. <laughs> like, let's, let's get some Team Gertrude shirts. But one yeah. thing, whenever you describe Madagascar, and this is the thing, I, I always pick on like one little thing from all your excursions that are just especially terrifying to me. But yeah. you, you just, you glazed over this. So we got to go back. The crocodiles <laughs> in the rivers. We're not talking about the little alligators at the zoos here in, in the United States. We're talking about crocodiles. We're talking about thousand pound freak beasts that are in the water. I just got to know when you were going through the rivers and you weren't on some sort of a raft, or even if you were, what was going through your head knowing that a dinosaur could be <laughs> lurking like somewhere nearby? Oh man. Well, we would make, we would, you know, what was difficult is, the area that we took, a lot of the time down south, there were more locals. So we were able to gain local knowledge to know how to cross the rivers. And there's always three ways to cross crocodile infested rivers. And that's either cross where there's, um, cross where there's locals. The locals will always guide you where, you know, and show you the point where the crocs don't have their territory. If there's no locals, cross where there's white water um, or rapids. Because again, the crocs don't lie where there's fast flowing water. The third option is cross with, you know, um, on a raft that we had to build from natural resources. But sometimes these rivers were, I don't know, only a couple of, only a few meters, you know, sometimes quite deep, sometimes up to your knees, maybe up to your waist. But you, you, it's a spend four hours building a raft to cross such a narrow part was just, Oh, we couldn't fathom that. We were like, oh, we need to just try somehow to get across it. So we would throw lots of rocks in the water. We would try to scare. If there's anything there, we'd try to scare off. So we were always making sure that we were vigilant before crossing the river. Uh, and so I would cross with confidence, knowing that there are no crocs, because I've put my preparation in. I've made sure we both researched. But yeah, there, there's always that fact that can you imagine if we were wrong and we made, this, made a mistake, right. as people do. right. Uh, I mean, that's, that's my thought. Uh, the thing is, is you're sitting here talking to us now. So it obviously worked out, but that, that is one of those things that people, again, people just can't fathom that they they're thinking about their hiking trip that they went on with their family in Arkansas and central United States, that they're not thinking about the different things out there that, that can really take you out. I mean, where I, where I live here in, in central Oklahoma, right in the middle of the U S really the only yeah. thing I have to worry about is rattlesnakes. And the, the interesting thing about rattlesnakes in my area is they've actually stopped rattling. 
so just going on a, a short little diatribe. Oh, wow. A lot of these rattlesnakes, what was happening is what these biologists think is that when they would rattle, that would alert, you know, hawks or falcons or, or eagles to, to where they were. And then they were right. you know, basically getting picked off. And so there's a lot of places in Southwest Oklahoma with the, the mountain, uh, mountain refuge that we have out there, the Wichita mountains where people are getting bitten by rattlesnakes that never rattle. And I even had a, an opportunity, I was walking a, a trail, you know, with a buddy and I look down right before my foot steps on the head of a rattlesnake and the rattlesnake didn't move. The rattlesnake didn't make noise. I didn't even know it was a rattlesnake because it was coiled up. And so I started Whoa. like waving, you know, I'm far enough back from it, but I, I take off my hat cause I was going to like try to wave it off the trail and my yeah. sunglasses fell off my hat. Where do you think my sunglasses fell? <laughs> oh, nightmare. Right on top right of the, on, right on top right of the damn it. snake. And so uh, the thing was, is after a second, he, he got bored with us and just kind of went on about his way. And then I saw his rattle and, and it never rattled one bit. And so, but I, I only tell that story to say that that's, that's what I'm nice, hyper. It? Yeah, it, it's, it's crazy. But that was the one thing I was hyper aware of. But when you're doing these things, you have to be hyper aware of so many different things. And hopefully that's a nice segue into the Yangtze River in China, which was kind of your big daddy. That was your big daddy mission. That was the one that really, I, I would say, got you the, the notoriety around the world that you probably deserve for being the lunatic that you are. But basically, <laughs> in, in August of 2019, you became the first, another world first, first person ever walked the length of the Yangtze River in China. And so for those of you guys that don't know that, that is the longest river in the world to flow through a single country. And you trekked 4,000 miles and it took you a year. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. where did you get the idea to even do a, a mission like that that was going to take a year of your life? Yeah, Mission Yangtze was, it was insane, really, you know. Um, I, probably it came to mind when I first went, when I first left, for my travel. So bringing it back to North Wales when I was 16, 17, I was working in a fish and chip shop. I then worked as a waiter and then I, I then worked as a um, lifeguard to save the money to make these travels happen in the first place. I was cycling every day to and from work. I was smashing out about 240 hours a month. Uh, and then eventually age 19, I set off and the first place I went was China. Uh, and I spent two weeks in China, but mainly the East Coast. You know, I went to Beijing, down to Shanghai, across to Hong Kong, over to Macau to do the world's highest bungee jump, tick that off the bucket list. Uh, and then when I look back at the map of China, you know, I always knew how big China was, but I realized that I, I didn't really travel China. It's huge. It's humongous, a massive country. And I was always fascinated about all its different provinces and diversities. I knew that it would be such a cool place to explore so i knew one day that i would probably be back and i really wanted to take on an adventure i didn't know when and i didn't know what but i believe that that probably stayed in my mind ever since i was age 19 um and when i finished madagascar i was now looking for pretty much the the biggest thing that i could find that hadn't yet been done and the Yangtze for myself just stood out as that there's no, it's no solo unsupported rules. It's no speed. It's no nothing. It's just a genuine thirst right there that hasn't yet been done. Um, it had been rafted, but no evidence to suggest that anyone had actually walked it. And when I looked into the details of that, I realized that actually the difficult part would be the logistics because China's a super sensitive place. And it actually took me two years over two years of planning to build up the right connections, to, to build a solid team, which I currently have out there, is actually bigger than my team here in the UK. Uh, I had to partner with the, the government, uh, with the police and authorities, with 14 different organizations out in China. Um, and that was, an, you know, that's enough to, to step the challenge up and think, wow, okay, even the planning is difficult before I've even set foot in China. And right. so I would say that was my attraction. It was the beauty. It was to showcase a side to China that, might not have yet been seen properly. It was just to explore the cultures, the traditions. And like with all of my expeditions, I never do these trips. Of course, for the first few years, I was just doing it just for the pure love and passion. But when I realized I could actually merge in and, and you know, environment sustainability, uh, biodiversity is very close to my heart. So with Mongolia, I was raising funds for the Red Cross. I was raising awareness for the uh, climate change and the effect it has on the nomadic way of life. And in Madagascar, I was also, I partnered with the tourism minister. I raised awareness for the Lima Network, uh, conservation helping to protect the unique biodiversity of the island. 80% of plant life and wildlife found in Madagascar 
is found nowhere else in the world, which is amazing. And with China, it was the same again. So I, the, the challenge was there, the reason, the motive, but I also wanted to, to help different environmentalists and organizations and partner up with the likes of the WWF uh, on this course. So once I had the plan in place and the challenge was there, it, it just now meant two years of really studying this, building up the right team and going for it, attempting it. Yeah, and the thing about it is this was a trip that had a lot of uh, issues as well because obviously you're spending a year of your life and it's not just on a happy trail. Uh, the, the thing was is you, you ran into a lot of issues, but one of the things that you didn't run into but was a constant threat was wolves and bears. And the craziest thing about that is for any of the guys listening to this, I got a lot of guys that listen to this in Colorado, Wyoming, different places in the U.S. where they have wolves and bears, but they can carry. They can carry a weapon. They can carry a rifle. They can carry a machete. They can carry, you know, TNT. They can carry something to protect themselves oh, yeah. from these am animals, but you couldn't yeah. even have a pocket knife while you were out there. So I just want to know, like an honest question, and if you don't know, you don't know. What was the plan if you ran in to a wolf or a bear when you were out there and you didn't have a weapon on you to protect yourself? The plan was just to always stay as vigilant as we could be and just to keep the bears and wolves at bay. However, if we did come across any yeah, you know, we, we didn't have any weaponry, um, no knives. Um, yeah, we had an air horn. We didn't even take spray because it's so windy there on the Tibetan Plateau where the source of the Yangtze is. And it's over 5,100 meters, almost the same height as Everest Base Camp. Uh, and so there's always that worry that it's, it's going to spray back into your face. And to be honest, it only reaches about 10 feet anyway. So if you're within 10 feet of a bear, um, you don't really have that time to get the pepper right, exactly. spray or whatever it is out. So, yeah, I guess numbers and sticking with each other. And that's why I'd always want to travel and walk with someone and resting up at the local communities because, you know, they offer shelter, they offer protection. Uh, but, of course, you know, the biggest challenge of this expedition was was possibly the people that, that joined me. Not that they were the challenge, but I found that you can prepare so much mentally and physically for yourself but you can't train for other people joining. And so the difficulty was having to evacuate these people and get them home safely if anything went wrong. Like I had people leave because they were in fear of the bears and the wolves because the locals would show us all sorts of scary photos and videos. You know, I sort of went out there with the healthy mindset, like leave the bears alone and the bears will leave you alone. But the locals were telling us otherwise. They were saying that the bears are coming off the mountains because it's too cold. Uh, it's, it's breaking into that season, into winter season, and they're looking for calories before they go into hibernation. And they were there saying that you're just walking calories. And if you don't yeah. believe me, look at this video. I look at this oh, video. And I was like, man. no, stop showing me. I'm already scared. Um, so, no, it was, yeah, it was serious. It was scary. <laughs> yeah, that that's the one thing is just not being able to to take carry yourself if something were to happen right in your face. But the, the, the message here, and I think it's important for everybody listening to this, is to be prepared beforehand. Because whenever you startle the bear, when you come around the corner and he didn't see you and you didn't see him yeah, at that point, there you go. it's too late. It's way too yeah. late at that point. Like your food, like you are just part of his morning routine at that point. But uh, that, I think that's really important to, to just remind guys to, to be very prepared in those situations yeah one thing that about is, that's the biggest attacks isn't it is when especially in tibet what i heard is like the tibets they'll go out for work they'll you know come around a tree or go on top of a hill and boom you'll shock the bear the bear will panic and it will just attack you well and the thing is is at that point you're you're in his backyard and you wouldn't yeah. want someone just walking into your backyard. It's just like you have to have a healthy reverence for an animal like that. Um, mm. And one thing about you, Ash, and if guys haven't uh, figured this out by now, you are an incredibly optimistic and thankful and positive guy. You try to figure things out. You try to just make things happen. And you've had a lot of opportunities uh, to say positive things about China. And you've, you've taken those opportunities to say the, the things that you like about China. But China, a, as a country, has a history as a brutal authoritarian, atheistic dictatorship, especially now. But I, the thing I want to know about from, from you, since you spent a lot of time in country, what are your thoughts on China as a country, as opposed to China as a people? Because obviously you have a tremendous, almost romantic view of the, of the Chinese people, and it's well-worn because of how, how well they took care of you on your uh, mission Yangtze. But what are your thoughts on China as a country? As a country, as in, are you talking now, it's diversity? 
Uh, no, not, not necessarily or... it's it's diversity, but like, so as a, for instance, we're recording this right now in the middle of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, you know, the, with the, the virus coming out of Wuhan, we've seen some pretty horrific things coming out about what China has done. They have literally barricaded people in their apartments. There are people that have starved to death. There are doctors that have been disappeared. Uh, some of the doctors that were trying to get the word out about the virus. It, it just kind of shows us some of the brutal nature of a dictatorial government, an authoritarian government like China, that these Chinese people that you love so much are under. So have you spent much time thinking about kind of what, what China as a country is versus China as a group of people? Yeah, and there's no denying that it can be incredibly harsh um, during certain times, especially with what went on with COVID-19, uh, for sure. And I, I do have a lot of friends out there. Uh, I, I was based in Wuhan, actually, where the virus kickstarted um, for three weeks. And I've got good friends, so I was checking in with them quite often. And it's crazy what you see on the news compared to, you know, the friends that I was writing who were living in the city center. He was like, yeah, all cool here, man. Just told to stay indoors, you know, out once a day for shopping. And so, I didn't, like, the Chinese almost seem super chilled and not all of them of course but maybe the ones that i mixed with just seem like super chilled like yeah it is what it is just stay indoors protect everyone and you know they didn't seem to have anything negative to say um but i guess at the same time in a population of 1.4 billion people right you've just got to act so fast and sometimes just so harshly um in order to to nip it in the bud I imagine, you know, it, it must be, it must be, I can't imagine, you know, 1.4 billion people, um, you know, yeah, the UK, we should have, we should have learned really from China's mistake and adapted well in advance, but now the numbers are rising and we're being hit hard here, but um, yeah. Yeah, it's a tough subject matter and there's, there's, you know, we could talk for the rest of the day on things that are going on in that country. That is the, the one thing that concerns me. But the, the thing mm -hmm. that I do like about what, what you've done, and you mentioned it just, just a little while ago, is you got to display some of the beautiful things about China that people would never get to see. Because for most of the world, China is just this big communist country on the map. Like they, they don't know anything about it. They only know about Beijing. <laughs> they only know about, you know, yeah. last time the, the Olympics were there. <clears throat> and uh, again, yeah. just the population. To, to be that size, there's going to be a lot of diversity. Obviously, you, you, you've talked about this before, just being able to communicate with people. Like if you were a Spanish speaking person, you knew no English, but you knew you were going to be spending a year in the United States, you can learn basic English. And English in Oklahoma and English in Maine is the same. We might have, we mm. might call some things differently. But for you, talk about what it was like trying to communicate with people when, you know, you knew some basic Mandarin, but there's hundreds if not thousands of different dialects yeah yeah it was so difficult and i only had what did i have probably not even a month's worth of lessons of chinese lessons and straight away this towards the source um it's near tibet so Qinghai province is is very influenced by by tibet and so they were speaking obviously tibetan and you know i just wasn't able to develop my mandarin because i was learning all of these different dialects and sometimes I couldn't communicate and it's, it was just so vastly different it was insane but luckily you know I think when when they saw this guy who's looking pretty sunburnt looking pretty knackered looking right. starving looking skinny looking thirsty you know and and then just approach him with a big smile they would always be very welcoming you know they invite us inside they feed me up shelter the lot you know sometimes even in the cities when I'd rock up in the cities and the authorities wouldn't allow me to camp out. So I'd stay in a hotel, of course. Um, and again, you know, they would sometimes just not charge me. They'd be like, Oh, we saw you on the news or whatever. We wish you the best on your journey. So it is amazing. And it's, it's a shame that China do get a lot of stick because, you know, from what I've experienced, the locals, are, and it, a good example is my friend, Martin, who joined me, he sort of had this, this idea that China was suppressed, of course, because of, you know, they don't have Google, they don't have Facebook, they don't have any of these platforms, they're sort of out of touch. And then he came there and he saw like this strong sense of community, everyone laughing, smiling, even old people age 80, 90 out in the street dancing, they've got the speakers out on the go. And it's just a, it's a pleasant place to be for sure. Um, and they were just so welcoming. And of course, they have their own social media platforms. And I was actually 
on those social media platforms. So I was probably juggling about 14 different social media platforms between China and the Western world. Um, and everything's just a little bit more tamed down on the Chinese social media. Everything's made um, with a little bit more humor, you know? Sometimes it's great, sometimes it's cringeworthy, but it's one of those, it is what it is, you know? And not as negative, I guess. Sometimes I wish the news here would be a little bit more lighthearted instead of so down and negative, but <laughs> there we go. Yeah. But, but yeah, it is a shame they get a lot of stick, but the people were just amazing, always inviting me inside, but that language barrier was tough. But luckily for Mongolia, Madagascar, you know, and it's all in his hand gestures, isn't it? Hand gestures, smiling, and just trying your best to um, communicate without the language. Right, exactly. I mean, point to your mouth and they probably can guess it, you're hungry or thirsty <laughs> at, at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, one of the things I really liked about your Mission Yangtze story is, or I guess it, it made me think, it made me ponder a lot, is that you mentioned mm. when you crossed the finish line on this trip, that you didn't feel anything, that you you felt that maybe you had over-visualized what completing this mission was going to be like. And um, are you familiar with Deion Sanders by chance? I'm not, no. Okay, so Deion Sanders is a, an American athlete. He, he's been long since retired, but he is right. one of the very few players to be a professional at two major league sports at the same time. He was a major league baseball player while at the same time being an NFL football player, American football player. Oh, wow. And so one of the greatest gifted athletes that we've ever seen, incredibly yeah. cocky guy, incredibly flashy. But anyway, he wins the Super Bowl. I'm pretty sure it's with the Dallas Cowboys. Is, uh, so he wins the Super Bowl. It, it's, that is the upper echelon. There's nothing bigger that you can win in the world. And he said when he was done at the locker room, when he was done celebrating, mm -hmm. when he was done with the champagne, he gets back to his room. He gets back to his hotel room. And he said he was more empty than he had ever been in his entire life. And it was because he had put his entire life's work into the accomplishment of being this world-renowned athlete and becoming a champion and an NFL champion. And he, his team wins the Super Bowl and he becomes the NFL champion. And, and that night, he realized that there was something massive missing from his life. And for him, he realized that it was Jesus. He, he, was, missing, he was missing out on God and on, on who Jesus was in his life. And right. he, at, at that moment, became, became a Christian and kind of embraced the spiritual side of life because he felt that emptiness. What I'm curious about wow. for you is because you, you passed over that in the Joe Rogan experience and you just mentioned it and, and Joe didn't really ask you a follow-up, but as a follow-up, how have you looked back on that moment of completing such a crazy, impressive mission only to feel maybe a little empty on the back end? Um, I, you know, I wouldn't use the word empty probably. I would, what would I say? I would, I would say is because I believed myself so much and all of the different challenges, like before the first four months, I'd lost 10 members of the 16 different individuals that joined me, joined different sections. You know, there were the bears, there were the wolves, there were the landslides. There were people going home left, right and center. So that obviously went into my subconscious and I was starting to worry whether I would make it to the end. But through these difficult times, there wasn't a day that I couldn't see myself crossing that finish line. You know, I was just so focused, so disciplined, in, in making it to that finish, that by the time that I had got there, as amazing as it was, it, it, it wasn't kind of like Usain Bolt running 100 meters. He sort of finds out. So from the start line to the finish, uh, I don't know how, I forgot what his record is, but within under 10 seconds, he, he has the result. Right. Whereas my result's different. It's over the space of three years that I'm working towards this goal. So when I do cross it, rather than being, oh my God, I can't believe I crossed the finish line. It's, you know, it's about damn time. I crossed right, the right. finish line, you know, and especially Shanghai, where the Yangtze pours out into the East China Sea. I had to shelter up because the day that I was supposed to finish, we got hit by Storm Lakima. So it was this big storm. And actually, maybe some of my hype was, was, or some of my excitement was squashed just a little bit because I'd always visioned that day. For the past two weeks, I was like, yeah, that's the day that I'm aiming for. We built up, people were joining, uh, the press were going to be there and whatnot, and my family uh, were joining. But now the storm hit, so we all had to rest up. So it was one of those, 
I've kind of finished because I've only got 15 miles left, but I've not finished until I've covered those 15 miles. So I had right. to wait for t- two days and then I cracked on. So when I crossed the finish line, that's why I was a little bit like, God damn that storm or whatever, you know. But then after that, I was just so productive. Uh, I had to cancel my, my celebration party because it was crazy. I was up till 3 a.m. with the news. Um, again, straight after I went on an Asia tour, going to Korea, Singapore, across China, even Myanmar. And so it, I didn't feel empty just because I was so busy afterwards, even busier, in fact. Uh, but maybe if there was nothing planned after and I would have been sat there and it was just quiet, um, then I don't know what I would feel. But, but fortunately, it was just it just went mental. It was, it was nonstop. Right. So I didn't really have time to reflect uh, as to what just happened because I had to concentrate on the next goal that I was working on. Well, I think that dovetails nicely. So that, that wraps up some of the missions. Now I want to just kind of talk about some of the excursions and the things that you experienced overall. And one of the things is, you know, people see, you know, the picture on the cover of your book and they see the stuff on your Instagram and it's all this really, really sexy looking stuff. But the, the problem is, is with most of what you were doing, you spent a lot of time doing really non-sexy stuff. You were just walking. Mm. You were just walking yeah. and traversing and watching your step and, and making sure you were hydrated and doing all those things. What did you do with that silence? Because a lot of these times you weren't having conversations with people. There weren't people with you. But on those days, on any one of your excursions, when you did have that quiet time where you could reflect, where you could almost just hear your body working, you know, what what was that like? What did you do with that time? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting you say that because I think even some people that joined me, because I opened it up to the public. I wanted it to be one of the world's most interactive world firsts. Um, and I think a lot of people who joined me were also hit by that. They see the social media, but then when they join me, they're like, well, there's that shock of capture, that shock of realization that actually this is so much harder than it looks on, than that photo looked on, on Instagram or whatnot, you know, because you have to put in the paces. No one's going to walk it for you. You've got you've to walk. And when you're faced with the threat of, of bears or wolves, no one's going to take you away. You've got to realize how you've got to overcome it. Only face with a landslide and then it detours you and you've got to spend an extra five days working your way around this cliff face or whatnot. These are just all challenges that sink into your mind that, you know, you don't really think about. It's the slug, it's the, it's the graft, it's the real grind of an expedition that can be tedious, it can be boring, it can be extremely lonely at times. Um, and, that, that, you know, that was tough with Mongolia, the loneliness, and that's where I, I faced the the fact that there's no such thing as silence when I started to hear my body ticking over because I was at such a point of silence. There was nothing other than my body functioning, um, which rings true to my logistics manager telling me you'll realize that there's no such thing as silence. So some days I would just listen to music. Some days I would just soak it all up and take it in. Other days I would just break it down and, and hate the days and think, right, just crack on through it. Tomorrow is another day. A big saying of mine, Tomorrow is another day. Don't focus too much on the shit times that happen today. Let's hope they don't happen again tomorrow. And if they do happen again tomorrow, let's just keep saying tomorrow is another day. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, that's the thing is you've got to have some sort of internal dialogue while these things are going on. Because, And at the same time, I'm sure there were stretches of walks where it was completely safe to have headphones yeah. in and be listening to music. Yeah, exactly. But then there's other yeah. times where you need to be hearing what's going on around you. So you, you've yeah. got to be aware at those different times. And on yeah. several, and you mentioned some of these times, but with several of your missions, there were different points where you were actually close to death. And not like your buddy that says, oh man, I was driving and I almost died. You didn't almost die. You hit a curb, Mm. you loser. But like you were really, (laughs) really close to death at certain points. And in those moments, did the thought ever enter your mind that, man, I regret doing this. I regret making this decision to come on this trek, to, to do all the things I'm doing because I'm so close to death. I mean, what was going through your mind at those moments? Yeah, I'd say possibly one of the worst ones was, um, maybe the Gobi Desert when I was pulling the trailer, you know, weeks went by, I was suffering with dehydration, slipped into heat exhaustion, well on my way to heat stroke, which is usually fatal. Uh, It was 100 degrees Fahrenheit plus. Uh, There was no breeze. There was no shelter. I was just out there in the desert uh, and I could almost feel my organs drying up. The days went on and I got worse and in much more agony. And at my worst point, I still had a good four days left to the next community. 
because uh, one of the previous wells was dry. So I was now rationing my last remaining dribbles of water, if you like. Um, and I was just in so much pain. The only shelter that I could find was underneath my trailer. So sometimes I'd lie underneath my trailer. I could only fit the top half of my body underneath and my legs would stick out and it felt like they were melting. And sometimes I'd stay under there for an hour at a time. Um, and it was possibly at that point that I realized, you know, if I don't keep getting up and pushing on, I'm going to die out here in the Gobi Desert. It was that right. harsh reality of, oh shit, you know, this is happening. What I visualized as being the worst case, the worst case is now taking place because that's a painful and slow death. Well, or fast, depending on your body type. Uh, people can die super fast of heat stroke within hours or they can drag out. Um, and for myself, I don't know, I had... I had missed the point of backup, as I was saying. I've got four days to wait for my logistics manager to get to me and then another day or two to get me out, let's say six days or four days guaranteed of walking and I'll definitely get there if I last the four days. Um, but I couldn't focus on feeling sorry for myself or, or regretting. I feel if you're in such a serious scenario, there's no time for that. Uh, my only option was to survive and I decided to actually break my goals down. I've always broken my goals down into little sections, but this is a, a good example of how it saved my life. Although I couldn't visualize the four days, I couldn't picture walking those four days in such agony. I could picture 100 meters. You know, I could see 100 meters ahead of me. So I focused on walking 100 meters because that's all I could manage, especially with the trailer pulling it behind me before resting underneath. And I would allow myself five minutes. So I, I effectively by breaking my goals down and setting myself a routine in the worst state imaginable, I was ticking off those 100 meter sections. And by staying disciplined because I wasn't motivated, I didn't want to be there, but I didn't regret the decision of being there. I knew that this could potentially happen. And now it's happened. I need to focus on overcoming it. Like I practiced in the training, like I visualized when I was, when I was on the grind back in Wales uh, and effectively 100 meters, five minutes resting, 100 meters, five minutes resting for four days. I did make it to that community. It's in a bad state. You know, my urine was black pretty much. It took me eight days to recover, um, but I made it. And so at that point of almost staring death in the face, if you like, I was just all about trying to stay positive or trying to break my goals down or just trying to visualize only the outcome, which is to survive and nothing else. I would, nothing, no emotions, no thinking about my mom or my dad. I just couldn't. I was just, at night time when I was in my tent, I would, of course, but at the same time, I would just drift off to sleep because I was so exhausted. And then the next day was another day. Um, so I didn't spend so much time thinking. I just spent my time trying to survive that stint, if that makes sense. <laughs> it absolutely makes sense. It's a story of resilience. And we talk about that all the time. And we'll get more into, you know, just what being mm. spiritually, mentally, physically resilient is. But I mean, one of the big things for you and guys that have read a lot of books about like Navy SEALs or things like that, a lot of those guys, when they're trying to get through BUDS, which is kind of the week of, uh, or that's six months of, of training. And then they have Hell Week, which is basically uh, torture for, for a week. The thing is, is they knew that they had to feed you. Like as, as a soldier going through that, you know that they have to feed you three times a day. And so mm. in between breakfast and lunch, it's not, oh my gosh, how many push-ups do we need to do? Oh my gosh, how many times do we need to swim uh, out to the buoy and back? It was, I just need to make it to lunch. And so that, exactly. that's kind of the same yeah. for you. It's like, I need to make yeah. it at the, to the end of this hundred meters and then I can keep going. And that's the, right. Yeah, the, the cool thing for you is, and you've you mentioned this before, is on your journeys, you, you especially the one along the Yangtze, you were highly dependent on villages and on people. And even in this scenario, you just described on getting mm. to that village, getting to those people uh, to, to kind of give you sustenance and to help you out. Why were you so certain uh, going into these missions or going into these, these trips that when you would get to these villages, why were you so certain that one, the people would even be there and that two, they would be willing to help you out? Yeah. Great question. Um, I knew a hundred percent from breaking the expedition down from the 78 days of Mongolia that it would take me because a lot of different experts and Mongolian adventures as well were saying it was impossible. What I decided to do with my logistics manager in the Royal Geographic Society was break it down and look at every single day so that we could find that impossible day. And we couldn't find that impossible day. Every day was possible. Um, and this community 
sometimes there were communities that would that would flag that would sort of disappear but this community that i was trying to get to after the four days uh, was a confirmed community we would have unconfirmed communities which i would pack more water uh, fill up my tank a little bit more for unconfirmed communities or there were confirmed and this one was a confirmed so i knew 100 that there were people there um but yeah again so they're helping me out you know it's never it's never really crossed my mind that the locals won't help me out and maybe that's because i set off on my travels at such a young age you know age 19 and i don't really have many bad stories or experiences of the locals apart from madagascar down, <laughs> down south you know right. where the bandits held at gunpoint um but that was like the military that was the bandits but the locals were there uh, during that time with the with the military and they heard you know rumors spread stories spread fast and they actually felt really bad and even then the Malagasy took us in they supplied us you know they even put a lock on the door because there were so many kids excited at the fact that we were there but we had just been from such a stressful time they padlocked us in that room so that the kids couldn't get in you know so that they could allow us to have our own space which was amazing so with Mongolia it never crossed my mind that these locals wouldn't help just through experience of how amazing they are and how giving and with Mongolia it just seemed to be mainly the females as well mainly the ladies that were so much more helpful uh, and on all of my expeditions now if I need help I do naturally approach um, the females more than the males because the males see you as a bit of a you know they'll see that trailer they'll be feeling your biceps they'll be they'll, maybe they'll be drunk especially in Mongolia they like their Russian vodka so and when you're exhausted, you know, close to tears, emotionally, spiritually broken, uh, that's the last thing you need. But the ladies, they almost feel your pain. Sure, and they, yeah. they share it. You know, they, they flip into mothering mode effectively, don't they? Um, yeah, absolutely. And they invite you inside. They give you water. It's almost they, their instinct. They know what you need. They know what you're looking for. So oh, they've just been absolutely incredible. So, and they were like that when I rocked up in that community. Um, I was almost collapsing. Uh, and they had, you know, they set up a bed for me dragged me inside and they um, helped me out during that time that I needed it most well and you mentioned this before but the thing is with most of these communities is you were fully prepared to compensate them for for helping you uh, to give mm. them money or give them something yeah. in trade for them Anything. to give you provisions yeah. and food and water and most of them wouldn't let you do that like, like right. kind of take us through what, what was that like, you know, having these people basically sustain your life and then say, no, 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 we don't want anything from you. Yeah, it, it was crazy. It was, it was mental. And I would always leave with oh, just such a high spirit. Um, not the fact that I didn't spend money because I wasn't asked about that. The fact that they were genuine when they were helping me, you know? Um, in Madagascar, I had times down south where, you know, it's really brutal down Madagascar. They really suffer, suffer to survive. You know, they really struggle. And so they'll try find a way. You're like an ATM machine. They will try to find a way to get money. Even if you're camping out in complete wilderness, the locals will rock up and say, this is my forest and you must pay me to stay here. Um, but the further north I got, the more generous they became. They weren't suffering as much, of course, so they're not as desperate. Um, and again, you know, with China and with Mongolia, I experienced this a lot where they just didn't want the money. They, they almost took offense to it, but in a nice way, knowing that I don't mean any offense by it. So they would look at my money and they would like sort of laugh, shake their, shake their head, shake their hand, and like push it back into my pocket. And, you know, then the community start giggling and I'm just like, wow, they really, they are really not bothered. They just want to do their, their good deed. And I did learn from my logistics manager, who's was Mongolian uh, called Jenya that um, when they see a guy out in the elements, they know how extreme their country is, how harsh the Gobi Desert is. So when they see another person, what they really want to do is, is to help out during his or her journey. Uh, and they were just like that. It was always surreal, to be honest. It was always surreal, but I got used to it. I would always try to give them something, whether it was coloring crayons for the kids, uh, paper and pen so they could write. So I did stock up on, on stuff on my duffel bag that I was carrying on my trailer. Just, just to give back, you know, but sometimes they just weren't interested, just happy to help. That's such a cool story about just kind of the, um, the positive aspects of the human spirit that you have those people that just, that's their desire. It's their default mechanism is to, to try and help you out. Now for yeah. you, Ash, uh, looking back on Mongolia and Madagas Madagascar and Mission Yangtze, 
out of those three big excursions, those three big missions, what are some of the, the bigger things, I guess, that you would do differently in terms of preparation? Because obviously you, you went through it and some of it's like, well, I prepared all I could prepare, but now this is facing me. I got to deal with it. What were some things that you would change about your prep? Um, well, now with the finance, now I'm not struggling, uh, I would have myself a proper trailer that didn't weigh right. 40 kilograms. Right. You know, I'd find something that was just as robust because mild steel is really robust. The problem is going with a carbon fiber trailer. It could potentially break. Um, but so, yeah, the trailer I would change. Maybe more water, maybe not. I don't know. I say more water, but so if I had more water in that stint in the Gobi Desert, would, would I have been able to continue with the trailer? Because now the trailer would be too heavy for me to physically pull because I was in such agony. It's one of those where I, I wouldn't change anything, but I think what, whatever happened needed to happen. Uh, and what I love is that saying, no, what, you know, what matters more than the mistakes you make is what you're able to learn from them. Fortunately, I've never been dehydrated since, or not to that extreme, since Mongolia. Um, with Madagascar, um, you know, I've always been breaking the goals down. So being lost in the jungle, we sorted section out into 50 meters and I was with a team. So I was more team reliant on that because there was a guide with me. Um, malaria, obviously that's a scare, but I did do my best to protect myself from that. I don't think I could have done any better. And China, China, I learned a lot. And with China, I learned that don't let anyone allow you to. Because I had lots of people say, you know, I'm from the military. I'll, I'll be able to join you, no problem. And I would instantly say, oh, okay, you know, that's awesome. Come and join me. But their training wouldn't be as on form and they would end up joining me to be sent home only a couple of days later. And that would put myself at jeopardy. That would put them at jeopardy. They've got right. a family at home, you know. And so I would be a little, a little bit more strict with who I allow on my expeditions now because – Sometimes I forget just how much I prepare and how much I train. Um, and so when someone sort of says, oh, yeah, I'll be a good, good team partner for you, let me join. Sometimes I'm a little bit too willing to say, yeah, sure, come and join. But then it turns up being a near death. Um, so that's what I learned is, is just we're all different, aren't we? We're all, and the training and preparation, it, right. it needs to be taken serious for sure. Well, you need to learn how to be a mean guy because it doesn't sound like you have any mean in you. So you just need to tell these people like, look, fatty, you can't come with me on this expedition. You're probably <laughs> going to die. Nice. Maybe yeah, that. <laughs> we'll, we'll work on it. Work on getting you a manager. That's a jerk. But um, just kind of get into some <laughs> some random questions now uh, just related to a bunch of different things. Sure. There's There's got to be expeditions that really are impossible. Now you've done three things that were considered or that, that weren't considered that were actual world firsts that we have no recorded history of anyone doing those things. But in your opinion, if, if you had to think about it, what expeditions really are impossible? Um, now that, that haven't been done or that have been done in the past? As in no, no. Just I'm, in general? I'm just talking about if you had to go in your wildest dream, obviously you can't walk to the moon or something ridiculous like that. But like, mm. what, are, what are expeditions that maybe people have, have talked about or even threw out there in just kind of like a fiction scenario that really, as an expert in this area, it's just not possible to do X? Um, it's a great question. It's a great question. I, I, from the top of my head, I can't, I can't think of an expedition that is, there's just always, there's always a way. Someone will always find a way as long as it's on, uh, may, maybe, maybe to do with the underwater world. Okay. You know, maybe there's certain exp explorations um, in the water world that just aren't possible just yet. Maybe that's due to technology purposes. But in terms of physical feats on land, I think humans have just done so much. Um, something that strikes me that I don't believe has been done, it's definitely not impossible, but it's a heck of a challenge, is the Congo River. Okay. There's something about that that absolutely screams suicide, death, right. and danger. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, but again, I think – and I. You know, between us, well, on the podcast, I was actually, before the Yangtze, I was planning to walk the Congo. Um, it was only that the Yangtze made more business sense because I was looking to, you know, develop the, the brand and turn it from a hobby more into a career that China as a market 
um, made much more sense than Africa as a market. So I pursued the Yangtze. But and now I feel that I'm pursuing a different area where the expeditions won't be as long, but hopefully um, just as ambitious, just as extreme, but more interactive and have a lot of the environmental angle as well, where we're creating hopefully TV shows. Uh, my Mission Yangtze documentary is still soon to be released. But the Congo, I wouldn't write off. Maybe one day, who knows? You know, if anyone's listening, the Congo right. would be a cool one. <laughs> yeah, it, it would be a cool one. But what's funny is uh, as soon as you said the word Congo, the first word that came to my head was death. And so uh, that it's interesting <laughs> that was the first thing you thought as well. But but with that in mind, you've mentioned the Congo and, and everyone's favorite thing to ask, you know, Ash Dykes is what's the next mission? I don't care about the next mission. I want to know the next, next mission. What is the mission after the mission, the one that's just like a twinkle in your brain that you're just barely even thinking about? What, what's out there on the periphery for you? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm always about planning one step ahead of myself. You know, when I was trekking Mongolia, I already planned out Madagascar in my head. When I was, before I attempted Madagascar, Mission Yangtze was always in my head. Um, but I've always finished my expeditions, my previous expeditions, sort of, raring to get onto the next one it's only recently that i've been smarter you know i've been a little bit panning it out more carefully um we're raring to go for the next one but we we have a good eight to ten different ideas and I, i've got a team now in in la i'm repped by wme we're currently in discussions with various tv channels about extreme adventures but shorter ones in different countries mixing it up and i do believe that's where my passion is now where instead of 352 days brute mission i can get lots of different missions lots of diversities lots of beautiful parts of different corners of the world um within that one year that it would take me to do one adventure if that makes sense and share it with the masses rather than just on the social media so we we've got big plans it feels like i'm just getting started i'm still young in this in industry uh, of 29 um yeah man it's exciting i wish i could say more i can't just yet but we are planning some very big and ambitious things that's for sure well if you want to make any announcements it's just me and you here like no one else is is gonna listen to this like it's <laughs> it couldn't possibly uh turn out badly for you um but one thing yeah. that i do do feel like it, i i need to ask is you know, people look at what you do. They look at the stuff on Instagram, they go to your website, they read your book and they're like, oh my gosh, this stuff is really, really impressive. This is really extreme. So I want to know from your perspective, through your eyes, what accomplishments have you seen other people pull off that you consider to be extreme that impresses you? Oh, so many, man. So many, you know, people are amazing and they never cease to amaze me. Achievements being accomplished nowadays and in the past, um, so everything, not just in the exploring world, but in, in the athletic world as well, in the business world, the corporate world, I think we're just rocketed on. We were going sky high. And, you know, humanity often is, it, it gets a lot of stick, doesn't it? You know, we've done some bad things as well. We've made some big mistakes, but, you know, we're still relatively young in this universe. And we're still learning. We're still developing. Um, but that's what I love as well, especially about traveling is, it can be the un untold stories that get you the most. You know, that's why I love when I finish my adventures, I can never let this get to my head. It will never get to my head because I know that much greater, bigger things have been achieved. But even the people that I meet in these communities and the lessons that they've taught me um, and the stories that they've told me, I can, I'm always humbled, you know, because I do know that every single individual has their own lesson to teach and has their own story to tell. Um, and no one's as more impressive than the next person's, you know, it's just your unique perspective, your unique story. So that's what I love about talking to different people. And that's what I love about travel and adventure. It puts me right out there to, um, to some wild stories, just to meet some of the wildest people as well. You know, it's, it's great. So I am impressed by many, many achievements, big and small. Uh, it doesn't matter. Well, when you see someone pull off one of these things, it's almost like a contagion. I, I was reading this book uh, called Unbreakable by a retired Navy SEAL, Tom Shea. And he talked yeah. about this, this uh, mission, which was just basically uh, not a mission, but he was just basically talking about this challenge to walk for 24 hours. And this is a retired Navy SEAL sniper. I mean, he's done some of the most difficult things on the planet. I think he said in his book, it took him three or four attempts to just walk for 24 hours. 
And, you know, you could, you could take a break to go to the bathroom and eat and stuff like that, but that's just been an, a contagion in my head. But you see people do these, you know, they set a world record for pull-ups or they, they set a, a world record for the amount of miles you can run in 24 hours. And it just, mm. it, it's a contagion. It stays in your brain. It sticks with you and it makes you it think is. about what's, what's possible, you know? Yeah, yeah, it does. And you know, that there's that message as well that I really love to give is that if I can do it, you can do it too. Um, I often am mistaken. A lot of people are sort of, yeah, but it's all right for him. He was, you know, coming from a wealthy background. Nope. He comes from, you know, he's well-educated. So nope, no university degree in, t- in that terms. Um, it's just a case of making mistakes, setting my goals, you know, and sometimes the big goal can be so daunting that I have broken that big goal down into lots of little chunks. And that's something that I believe everyone can relate to, you know, no matter what you're facing, what you're going through. I've had people say that it's not possible. And it doesn't matter if no one else sees it for you. You know, what's important is if you can see it for yourself, stay on track. Uh, And that's the sort of message that I like to give out, not necessarily talk about my time in the jungle or my time across the desert, but how they can relate because we all do kind of face our own kind of jungle or desert in our own day to day life. Um, And hopefully given off some lessons that I learned that helped me out in the extremes that can help them whether it's the corporate world or the, the education world or whatever that might be. So, um, you know, we're all going through some, some crazy things and some great things just stick at it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's the thing is it's just you put something out in front of you because if you're living this life of just this sedentary and most, most of the time when you use the word sedentary, people just think about people sitting on a couch, but a lot of people are mentally sedentary as well. They're, they're not putting mm-hmm. something out there in front of them to, to strive towards or to really look for. And so for you, uh, you've obviously done a lot of really crazy extreme things before the age of 30. Uh, in, in realistic fashion, Ash, what age do you think you'll stop doing the, the really extreme stuff? Like, I mean, you'll, you'll probably be doing the, the trekking and traversing for the entirety of your life. But have you thought about an age where you're like, yeah, I'm probably not going to, you know, go across rivers that have crocodiles in them? Um, well, in terms of when I, when I talk about now more well, the business, you know, business marketing, the entrepreneurial world fascinates me. So it's a case of I'll need to get sensible in terms of transferring it into all of these physical sort of adventures to more of a business. You know, maybe I could, I, I would love the idea of TV where I'm doing shorter uh, adventures where there's a team there, but that we're showcasing these beautiful parts where we're capturing these stunning parts of the world that I've gone to or, or plan to go to um, on proper HD camera instead of GoPro. You know, we can share that. Um, building, it, building it as a brand and, and branching out to many things uh, like the talks, like the book that I've got, like the TV shows, and not necessarily just within uh, physical adventures. The physical adventures will always be there, but they'll only be as big as I'm able to handle, if that makes sense. So right. I still believe, and it's crazy, isn't it? You've got a guy called Mike Horn, who's a big inspiration as well. He, um, he is 50, I don't know his age. I'm sure he's early 50, let's say 54, 55. Uh, and he is currently, as we speak, attempted to become the first person ever to circumnavigate the planet via both poles using non-motorized um, vehicles. So even he's sailing, he's not using a yacht. Uh, okay. You know, and he's, he's in his 50s. So I think with this world, it's not like the boxing world. You know, I'm, I'm highly into the martial arts and, and so, so are you. Like with the boxing and with the martial arts, that it, that's kind of a young man's game, isn't yep, it? Yep, you know, you, you get in there, you make the cash and you get out there uh, sort of as, as fast as you can. Whereas this, it, it, isn't, it isn't that, you know. As I said, he's mid-50s and he's, he's just finished skiing across the Arctic, I believe. Um, he's sailing, you know, he's then trekking. It's, and he, so, yeah, and his biggest sponsor is like Mercedes. So he's actually earning some crazy mega bucks. He's a household name, a brand as well. Um, yeah, man, I don't know. It's interesting. It's interesting. Well, you got time to think about it. So I just wanted to kind of put that in your brain. Hell, may I might end up being your manager. I'll be the mean guy that tells people to leave you alone <laughs> and get you to think about, about stuff in a business sense. But one of the things that I think a lot of guys will, will be interested to hear, because we got a lot of guys here that have a lot of gear, a lot of outdoor gear. But the thing yeah. about it is you walk into an outdoor store and there's so much junk 
in there and you don't even mm. realize it's junk because it looks nice and it's in cool packaging and there's some really cool dude using it in the commercial. But what I would like to, to know, what I would like our listeners to know from you is what are the essential pieces of equipment and brands, you know, with the brands for trekking and for some of the outdoorsy things that, that people would maybe do themselves. And what are some of the things that, you know, we as consumers think that we need, but we actually don't need them? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's another good question because I've used lots of different kit depending on the environment that I'm, that I'm in, you know, the, the country that I'm trekking through. Um, so judging by the kit that I've always had with me for all the different terrains is so first and foremost would be my water filtration bottle. Um, that's just called water to go. So that was originally created by NASA. I believe it's like a filtration technology where you don't need to boil the water. You don't need to use the pump action filter. You don't need to place a chlorine tablet inside. This is literally the filter so strong that you can top up. I think the worst I've topped up from was a mud puddle in madagascar oh wow it scooped up mud scooped up sand but it, it, you know a lot of water there too um and it filters through as fresh water it gets rid of 99.9 percent contaminants and all bacteria and i've never had an illness from water um from uh, on mongolia madagascar and mission yangtze i've even drunk from the yangtze river using these bottles so that's my probably my number one because water is obviously um, a crucial, a crucial one, isn't it? When you're on these adventures. So the water to go bottle, um, footwear is obviously another crucial one, but I don't know if I'm the right person to give that advice because all of my time, although I've walked over 7,000 miles, <laughs> different countries, I have just worn trainers. I don't like boots because really, okay. You know, I've, I've touched wood. I've never actually I've never twisted my ankle, so I don't really need that ankle support. And I've gone over crazy terrains. But, you know, when the boots get wet, especially in the jungles of Madagascar, that's it then. They are soaked. They take days to dry uh, and they become really heavy as well. And so the reason why I took trainers is because they're comfortable, they're lightweight, they dry easy. So it's these little things. And I know that the military use boots, um, but I don't know, man. I just, for, for myself, it's always been either sandals you know, go like the locals. The locals' knowledge is the best knowledge. And this is why I love learning more survival from the locals, um, just because they teach you so many little things that are sometimes very basic. Um, isn't it the guy that walked the Amazon River? He, he just wore Crocs. <laughs> you know, some wow. basic wow. stuff. So sandals and trainers, uh, a knife or a machete. So the machete came in handy for all sorts um, in Madagascar. So again, depending on the terrain that you're walking for, walking through. But yeah, foot, footwear, water to go bottle, um, good compass, um, waterproof clothing. I can be like an overall. I normally go with the overalls because I, I layer up uh, on these, especially in the cold environments. And so I would say, yeah. And then like a little stove, a little lightweight stove. Uh, what one was I using? Omni, an Omni stove, I think it was. Okay. And that I took, I used that because not only does it fuel off gasoline, um, but it also off vodka or any whiskey, you know, so it actually uses the vapors and can hold the flame. And so I used that in Mongolia because if there was no petrol station on route, which a lot of the time there wasn't, the locals do love their vodka. <laughs> and so right. I, could, yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't need to, but I could pretty much purchase vodka, top up my stove and there you go. I'm, I'm, I'm cooking for my ration packs. I got you. So what about, what about stuff that you've seen a lot of people buy that really is just takes up room in, in a pack and just, you just don't need it. It's just not, not any good for what you need it for. Um, uh, what would that be? I don't know, but there's a lot of stuff on my journeys when I'm trekking that I realize I don't need and I do get rid of. And that is mainly electronics. That's mainly electronics that I found. I'm just backing up everything. Oh, I need extra batteries or extra cables um and i need a third cable in case the second cable breaks after my first if the first right. goes you know right it, yeah it's... and then once you start that flow you you tend to triple back up absolutely everything then and then you've got a rucksack which should be three times as light um so i would say, i would say sometimes the electronics um and and clothes as well clothes is a big one so if you go into a hot country you're out in the 
in the wilderness. No, you don't, you don't, you don't need to smell nice. Just take one shirt or two shirts and rotate them. Wash one, wear the other. When that dries, switch it up. Some people can take too many clothes. Too, oh, I take this t-shirt. Oh, I take a couple of these shirts. I take four pairs of trousers. Right. Let's take 16 <laughs> pairs of box, box of shorts. Sometimes you've just got to recycle and rewear <laughs> that same old shirt many and many a times. Hey. Fair enough. Well, guys, uh, you heard it from the, the main guy here so that he knows what he's talking about. So what he's telling you is don't take underwear on your trips. That's what I heard him say just now. <laughs> you don't need underwear. Uh, well, one thing that, that we've talked about, and obviously this is just a, a through point for your entire life is resilience. And on this podcast and, and with this ministry, we talk about spiritual, mental, and physical resilience all the time. We, we don't talk about strength because strength can wane. I mean, half Thor Bjornsson here in May, um, you know, uh, or he, he's trying to set a bunch of deadlift records and, and there's the world's strongest man. And the day after the world's strongest man competition, the guy mm. that got the, the biggest trophy is not the strongest man in the world anymore because his body's broken down. You know, there's somebody else that day that's stronger yeah. than he is, but resilience is different. Resilience is the ability to bounce back, to, to be able to, to, you know, perform even in the face of adversity. And so for you, what can you tell us about the importance of spiritual, mental, or physical resilience in your life as opposed to strength? Yeah, you know, all of my expeditions, I'd probably say that 70% has been based on mindset. You know, physical attributes are obviously very important, but I believe the mentality, your mindset can get you through just so much. Uh, and I've experienced it in many difficult times where I've had to walk with malaria when I'm hallucinating. You know, when I'm hacking through the jungle, I, I have stayed disciplined. And that, it was actually in the jungle where I learned we can't always be motivated, but we can be disciplined. Um, and just being resilient and bouncing back through I remember suffering with malaria, actually, and my parents were on the phone saying, what are you doing? You know, it's not a cold. It's not a flu. It's, it's the biggest disease in human history. You know, you need to get yourself back home. But I knew that I could bounce back from it. I knew I was in safe hands. And as long as I listened to the doctor, um, I could then start performing these exercises in my bedroom that wouldn't just help me put on those 13 kilograms that I lost by doing push-ups, swimming, sit-ups, etc., but would help to strengthen up my mindset because after being hit hard by something like that, you, you know, all of these doubts, all of these fears slip into your mind. Um, and so what I was doing, why I was training was, you know, I always say, you've probably heard me say it before, is I believe fear comes as a package deal. It comes with doubt. Right. Um, fear is healthy. Doubt, I believe, can be toxic. You know, the only way to get rid of doubt is through your preparation, is through your mindset of knowing your abilities, knowing your confidence levels, knowing whether you can continue or not. And I do believe that that's the difference with being able to continue and not being able to continue. You know, it's like that famous saying, he who says he can't and he who says he can, you are both usually right. It's that mindset that is just so powerful that will make that body perform, that will make you bounce back from traumatic experiences and push on against adversity and see it through all the way to the end. Um, so, yeah, mindset, mind over matter. It is definitely 70% mindset, 30% physical. And that's the thing, guys, we talk about all the time. It's resilience. It's the ability to, to work through something because the thing is, is if you were born to be 5'10", like I am, you're 5'10". There, there's nothing you can do to be seven feet tall. You know, some guys are born with natural speed. Some guys are born with a perfectly chiseled body that they don't really have to do anything with. But none of that matters at the end of the day. What actually matters is your ability to perform because, you know, you've, you've seen a lot of guys and you've seen in fighting. Think about the guys that have bad bodies bodies that would absolutely murder you like Daniel Cormier or you know Shogun Hua doesn't really have a <laughs> yeah. great body these aren't guys that look like they've been cut out of obsidian these are dudes that that are just they are they are who they are they have the body that they have but they're doing all they can with it and so uh, it's funny I, I talk about uh, MMA fighters now I, I do want to transition a little bit I do want to ask you about your your training in Muay Thai because you mentioned very very early at the beginning of the podcast 
that you mm. lived in Thailand for a couple of years. You trained Muay Thai. You had some fights. You even had a stadium fight, which some people don't know how big of a deal that is, but that that's everything over there. That That is the Super Bowl uh, for people in Thailand. So the, the question I guess I have for you is, again, you were a young guy, but a lot of mm. people avoid training the real martial arts. So, you know, not Wing Chun or Aikido or Karate or any of that stuff. Like I'm talking about the real martial arts like Jiu-Jitsu or Muay Thai or kickboxing. They just, they won't train those things for whatever reason. So for you, what was the impetus but behind even wanting to start training and then kind of take us through a little bit of what it was like training Muay Thai in the motherland of Muay Thai? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I've always been fascinated with just body movement, martial arts, uh, one-on-one combat, you know, the discipline and motivation that comes with it. I was, I was doing a lot of boxing here in Wales when I was younger. Um, and it was, it was probably when I did see my first stadium fight in Bangkok, when I first went traveling, when I was 19, you know, the crowd swarming it and the music that goes on. I'm sure you've heard the music. It's very creepy. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Sort of screeching noises, but with the drums, you know, sort of praying to the ancestors before the fight as well. Um, and it, I just saw it. And there's the, the car that goes past with the big banner sticking out the trunk and a guy sort of announcing it through a big microphone saying the world's most devastating martial art Muay Thai tonight at 9pm with the music playing that I don't know I was just hooked I was like I, w- I want to try this and I got my ass handed to me first because I was in that boxer's stance and so the Thai fighters were just obviously going destroyed for the weakness, that which was just oh, destroyed just it jack up my leg completely some days I'd need to take the following day off work because I couldn't climb back out of the ladder when I was scuba diving onto the boat because my leg wouldn't bend, you know, my knee wouldn't bend. Right. Um, but they, I nipped that in the bud. I, I was training five times a week. Um, it was amazing training with the ties just to see how focused they are. They would sleep at the gym. They would wake up. They would train in the morning. They would train in the afternoon. They would train again sometimes in the evening and then sleep at the gym. But for these guys, you know, there's a dark side to Muay Thai for sure. Um, A lot of them are trying to be the next big fighter so that they could earn the big bucks and pull their family out of poverty. Uh, But at the same time, there was this very positive vibe about it also. You know, they're training, they're keeping fit, they're eating healthy, they're learning a lot about themselves, but also each other. They're not going out drinking or doing drugs. They They have this sense of community. And I love being part of that community. I had a few different club fights, which was awesome. You know, I was constantly working on my defense because the last thing you want is, a, is an elbow to your forehead and like 16 stitches across your forehead, which I have right. seen before now. Um, and yeah, I went in for my, my first stadium fight where the, the guy, sailed, my opponent, should I say, sailed from mainland Thailand across to Koh Tao, the island I was living on. And it's sort of... You know, the person that wins leaves with the money. The person that loses goes home with nothing. Um, and so he obviously wanted to be paid. I wanted to be paid because I was only a, a low-budget backpacker, not earning much as a scuba diver. And if I win this fight, it paid probably three months worth of accommodation. Yeah. And we just went at it. We just went at it. Uh, and it was, it was actually the easiest fight I had. The club fights were much harder, but I, I think he came in quite cocky sort of, you know, I've had six fights. This is his first stadium fight, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to beat him. But I trained hard, man. I'd be up at night, beating my shins with a book or with a stick, trying to kill the nerve endings, taking it very serious. And I went in there with everything that I learned and, yeah, managed to get the knockout within 12 seconds of the first round. <laughs> oh, wow. Jeez. What did you knock him out with? It was uh, two head kicks, roundhouse kicks, and then it was the left. I missed him with my right but the less of the pattern on my well, on the gloves because Thailand is obviously very old school, no health and safety when it comes to to the um, martial arts, and so the pattern on my gloves had been used for so many years that pretty much the the pattern had been pushed to the side, so it's almost like bare knuckle. Um, and it's that that I caught him with, just lunged in with the with the left, and he and he dropped. Yeah, it, it's up on YouTube as well. Actually, the fight is actually on YouTube. Someone filmed it. Well, I'll definitely find that and put it in the show notes so, it's, so the guys can check that out. But that, that's awesome. I just love hearing about people that go on, on these journeys and, and do that because it's a different world when you train something versus when you compete. And so a lot of guys mm. listen to this podcast do jujitsu. And guys, nice. if you've not competed before – as stressful as, and as insane as it is, especially if you're, if you're wired like I am, you know, just a lunatic, super competitive, it's just different. <laughs> it, it's a different soreness afterwards. It it's a different a buzz, intensity. Isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah. well, and the thing about it is, is like, and if you're doing a local jiu-jitsu tournament, there might be 10 people watching you do this. And then yeah, you, you yeah. fast forward and you watch a UFC and they're like, wait a minute, there's like 20,000 people in the stands watching this fight. There's millions Mental. of people around the world watching this. And they're just cool as a cucumber walking down. You got Conor McGregor doing his billy walk around. The, <laughs> the octagon couldn't be looser. It, it's just a crazy yeah. thing to think about when people get into that. It is. So, it um, is. It's one bonkers. cool thing for you, but before the age of 30, you pretty much wrote a memoir. There's not a whole lot of people that write books about themselves before the age of 30 because they haven't really accomplished much. But you wrote a book called Mission Possible, A Decade of Living Dangerously. And so what was the process like for you of recounting your adventures in a book? Oh, man, the book was a stressful time for me. <laughs> okay. it's, so, it's so difficult to, uh, oh, but, you know, I stayed disciplined. I had a ghostwriter as well. Weirdly enough, I, I actually stuck to keeping a journal just for self purposes. You know, when you're off traveling, age 19, you're just sort of writing down what went on on this day, probably never going to look at it again. So just write it down rough. But I took photos along with those days that I was obviously writing down the journal. So I had to piece together the writing from the journal and the photos to help jog my memory for what happened, you know, eight years ago, nine years ago, whenever it was. Um, but it was amazing. So that book, it pretty much discusses, you know, the normal background that I come from, um, living on the coast in a small town called Old Colwyn, sort of the dreams, the aspirations. It covers the training. It covers the goal setting, mapping out how I decided to, to travel, you know, with this big mind map, how I could achieve it. It covers, you know, what I like about this book, it's very varied. If you don't like walking, it's got cycling. If you don't like cycling, it's got scuba diving. If you're not into extreme sports, you've got your martial arts and your fitness. So it covers lots of different countries, lots of different activities. And it pretty much builds into what made me take that first step of taking on Mongolia and then how I transitioned it from just like a hobby, the love of passion, to then environmental work, to then uh, a career. Um, and it's got lots of crazy stories. I like to make notes in the book of how people can can hopefully relate and take something from it for them to use in their day to day life. And so, yeah, but the process, it was a long process, but we had to wrap it up fast. I think we had to smash it out within six months because I had a UK theatre tour and we wanted the books to be ready for when I toured um, around the UK. But um, and again, you know, 2017, it was published. Um, but it's it's doing better than ever now because people want to sort of rewind as to what happened before Mission Yangtze, and and they've pretty much got it there, which is awesome. That's that's great, and we are going to link to that in the show notes as well. We'll link to your website, which has all your social media and your book stuff as well. But before we let you go, we we like to do a section at the end of our interviews with people that aren't lame, and you're certainly not that. And it's a section called "What Would You Say to Someone That Said." And then I'm just going to fill in the blank. I'm going to fill in the blank. And these are lightning round. Okay. So you've got, you've got 30 seconds or less to give us your answers on these. So no fluff, no nice guy. Just get right to the point. So you up to it? <laughs> Let's do it. All right, man. What would you say to someone that said you're going to die young? Fucking let's live well then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't even need the 30 seconds because you went right in. All right. Next one here. <laughs> what would you say to someone that said, I want to become an extreme explorer. Go for it. It's possible, you know, um, and be ready to hit the low points, but the high points will be so much worth it. Uh, boom. Go for it. I'd say, yeah, I was trying All to right. rush that then. All right. What would you say to someone that said, why don't you just take it easy? Um, you're probably right, but I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's good. That's a good answer. All right. Next one here. What would you say to someone that said, I struggle to push through the hard parts of workouts? You pushed through and that's the main thing. That's right. A little bit of perspective. All right. Next one. Isn't here. it? Yep. What would you say to the, someone that said, I just don't have time to focus on my physical fitness right now. I don't have time to focus on my physical fitness right now. I could be a jerk and say that's a major excuse. But at the same time, I, it, it depends what they're going through, doesn't it? I guess. I guess. Imagine if I said, oh, that's an, an excuse. And I'd say, yeah, but blah, blah's dying. I'm suffering with this. Then 
<laughs> there you go. That's the nice guy inside me coming up. Well, that is the nice guy. But I think your original response is the one we'll want to go with. Because, because you're, <laughs> and so we'll, we'll get back in. I only got a few more of these for you. But the sure. thing about it is most people that are going through crap, whether it's mental stuff or family stuff, there's always time to do something. I always encourage mm. guys like, oh, I don't have time to work out. It's like, well, you can work out at home. You know, you can get a great workout with the, the human body and mother earth. Do 100 burpees. What will that take you, 10, yeah. 15, 20 minutes? Like that, that'll get you pouring with sweat. And so for most people, working out will actually help a lot of their issues because there's a strong correlation between physical exertion and mental mm. health. And some people that struggle with mental health, and again, I'm, I'm, not a, you know, I'm not a doctor, so I can't prescribe anything, but there are people that are living a sedentary lifestyle and having mental struggles. And if those people yeah. start to exercise and start to work out, a lot of their quote unquote life problems that they're going through, they kind of disappear. You know what I mean? It's true, isn't it? Yeah. Tyson Fury, if you, you know about Tyson Fury? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it, that's that's a, a perfect story right there. He didn't take any substances, I believe. He just started to set his goals, which gave him motive and started to train, which set off those positive endorphins. Absolutely. And well, that dragged him out of depression, didn't it? I believe. It did, and uh, I'm messing up my own uh, show now by, by going off on a diatribe. So let's get back into it, Kyle. Focus, <laughs> focus here. All right, here we go. I got, I got three more for you. What sure. would you say to someone that said, you shouldn't put so much trust in people? Oh, oh you got me stuck on that one. You shouldn't put so much trust in people. <clears throat> you could be right. You could be right, but at the same time, I'm the opposite. I do put trust in people because nine times out of ten, it, um, it comes off the way that I hoped and wanted. So I would say have more trust in people. I would, I would reply the exact opposite to what they said. Have more trust, have more faith. All right. Well, faith is a, is a good one because here's the next one. What would you say to someone that said, whether you believe it or not, God was with you every step of the way on all of your expeditions? Um, I would like to hope so. <laughs> I hope so. That's all you're going to give me? You would hope so? <laughs> you got to give me something else. <laughs> um, okay, so what, what, what was it? What would you say if someone said that God was with you every yeah, step, every of, step the way? of the way on your expeditions? Damn right he was. I don't know. I don't know what to say. To hey, that, really. hey, you know what? Fair enough. That's the thing. <laughs> I wanted to ask you that just because, you know, I, I've listened to a lot of stuff you've done. I've read a lot of stuff and you, mm. you don't you don't ever get asked questions about that. And so I will yeah. ask questions that will kind of challenge that because, you know, yeah, it's good. I like it. I this is like a Christian it, yeah. podcast, you know, obviously a belief in God and Jesus as, as a savior is, is an yeah. incredibly important thing. And so I try to make sure that at least everybody, I'm trying to put a rock in That's your shoe, I guess, you know, yeah. just have you think about that, but Hey man, I got one. And who knows, for you. who knows how maybe he helped me get out from under that trailer, you know, who knows well, you, and push on. Well, here's the thing, Ash, and you know, you know, this isn't church, but I'm going to take you to church just a little bit. M my belief is that for, in order for you to have accomplished the things that you did, that, that God gave you an ability, he gave you a mind to reckon, and he also gave you a work ethic, but you made the choice because in nice. order to love God, you have to have free will. I mean, mm, it, because- I like it, that. So if you think about it, and this is C.S. Lewis, so I'm totally plagiarizing from another Englishman. But at the same time, is a world full of robots, a world full of automatons would not have been a world worth creating. So in mm. order for us to be able to find God, in order for us to be able to trust in Jesus for our salvation, we have to be given choice. And so when we see people use their choice to hurt others, which you saw along the path on your expeditions, um, yeah. when you see people do ugly and terrible and horrifically evil things to other people, it's because God had to give people free will in order for them to be able to have the capacity to love. And so that's one thing whenever I read about someone like you, and I promise I'll get to my last question. When I read about yeah, no, like you and whenever I hear the things that you go through, I see God all over it because there was a protective hand on you. There was provision. And in the moments where death was close, there was somebody there to help you. But here's the other part of it is even if you weren't saved, even if you didn't make it to that village when your, when your pee was black and all those different things, God mm. was still there with you. And that's not the end of the story. When your lights turn out for the last time, that's not it. You don't just become grass. There, there is a life afterwards. And, and that's what I like to talk to people about. Does that make sense? 
going to say, yeah, that does make sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like that. All right. We'll, we'll close my sermon and we'll go to the last question of the day. And maybe the most important question we got, what would you say to someone that said Ash Dykes has a death wish? Uh, yeah, I, I, I get that a lot. Actually. I get that a lot. Um, and what I would say is, yeah, if you look at it from the outside and that's the, the thing that, um, in, so there's quite a long answer. Uh, that's the thing that Instagram portrays, you know, it shows the sort of the limelight, the, the great stuff going on and the near deaths and the struggles and the dangers because people love to hear about bears. But what they don't see in a lot of things as well, same with the training, you win a, you win a, um, a Muay Thai fight, but they don't see the, the prep that you put into that. It is meticulous planning. It's all about trying your best to research what could possibly go wrong and then learning and studying how you could possibly overcome it. And if you don't think you can overcome it, don't do it. Um, sometimes I had to pull myself back and delay an expedition by a couple of weeks because I wasn't quite ready. I didn't know why I wasn't ready. There was just something that I just didn't, the confidence levels weren't there and I had a, a bit of doubt uh, and I didn't pursue it until I felt 100% uh, confident that I could not only take it on, but overcome each of the challenges in order to make it back alive. So I would definitely say it's not a death wish. It's meticulous planning and attention to detail. Well, that is a fantastic answer. And I can't think of a better place to leave it, man. You've given us a lot of time. We certainly appreciate it. And we, we've talked about a lot of different subjects, but that's all for me. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? No, I think that's the lot. That was really cool, Kyle. Uh, in, enjoyed that. And thanks for having me. Um, but yeah, you know, people know where to find me. The website, the Instagram is what I keep more up to date. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll keep in touch. Yep. And uh, we'll put all those links in the show notes. So Ash Dykes, thanks for coming on Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. Thanks for having me. Much appreciated. There you go, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed that interview, guys. He was just so humble and generous with his time, and I really enjoyed talking with him. We, we actually talked for probably 10 or 15 minutes off air before we even started recording. I was like, oh, crap, we better start recording this because we're already saying some pretty cool stuff, but really, really awesome guy. But before we let you guys go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost, and as you know by now, we are a men's ministry, and our mission is cultivating manly resilience. Specifically, we do that by providing content like this podcast that forges spiritual, mental, and physical toughness. So the website links I've got for you today. I've got a link to Ash Dyke's website. So the website is just kind of a good center point for everything. So if you want to follow him on social media, go there. You'll be able to see that. If you want to get his book, go there. You won't be able to see that. If you want more information on the missions, you'll be able to see that there. Also, I've got a link to his episode with the Joe Rogan experience. It was episode 1410 from earlier this year. And then I was able to find the, uh, the video of him doing his Muay Thai fight. So you can see a little bit of his training in the prep. And so guys, if you've never seen a Muay Thai stadium fight before, it's awesome. You got to check it out. That is in the show notes. Thanks so much. We really appreciate you listening to the podcast. If you would, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Stitcher, and refer your friends to listen and share this on social media. If we deserve a five-star review, guys, please leave us five stars, and don't forget to leave us a few comments letting us know why you like the content. I'm currently booking speaking engagements for the remainder of 2020 and the beginning of 2021, so if you want me to come speak on your podcast, at your men's event, at your whatever, hit me up, info at undaunted.life. Again, that's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Our website is www.undaunted.life. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Undaunted Life or Facebook.com backslash Undaunted Life. Check out our free devotionals on the YouVersion Bible app. Just search Undaunted Life under plans. And as always, we want to thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their entire music library for our content. The intro outro track on this podcast is their song Defender, which is off their latest record entitled Guardians. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep cultivating manly resilience keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical toughness, keep seeking the lion.